Thanks so much to all the students um, from East Timor, from Portugal, and the students here in East San Diego in the Southeast Asian History class. Um, it's they've been so enthusiastic and so just fired up. So they're so excited to listen to all of you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's really wonderful to see the, the number of participants uh, grow and, and the Zoom session getting bigger and bigger with more and more um, pages um, on the screen here. Uh, so we'll get started in a couple minutes, give, give people a few more minutes to, to log on um, and, and before we get, get started.
All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Matthew Vitz. I am a uh, professor in the history department. I teach uh, Mexican and Latin American history. Um, I'm also the director of Global South, the Global South Studies program here at UCSD. Um, Global South Studies is the main the main sponsor of this event. Um, this event is uh, called Climate and Environmental Justice in Southeast Asia. Um, so you know as as climate destabilization worsens, it's really so important that we at college campuses like UCSD create opportunities for people, for voices from different parts of the world to share their stories and to share their efforts to build climate and environmental justice. Um, so this event um, here right now marks just one of, one of these efforts. Um, Global South Studies, this, this uh, undergraduate, uh, small undergraduate multidisciplinary program with a major and minor um, is uh, within the uh, larger um, Institute of Arts and Humanities here at UCSD. Um, and our mission at Global South Studies is threefold, to introduce students to the concept of the Global South, as well as the older concept um, uh, of the third world and interrogate their origins in political struggle and cultural production. Two is to introduce students to the various historical, cultural, political, and economic perspectives on the Global South and its relationship with the Global North. And three, to teach students the stories, concerns, and issues of Global South communities. And I would also add as a kind of an addendum to that last um, uh, mission, um, we're really interested in building relationships with communities um, of, of, um, in the Global South um, and communities um, such as uh, Southeast Asian communities, uh, Latinx communities in the region of, of San Diego and Tijuana. Um, this event would not have been possible without generous support from various co-sponsors across campus. So I want to um, uh, briefly name them um, and thank them. Uh, International House, uh, Mir College and the Environmental Studies Program, the Nature, Space and Politics Working Group, uh, which is part of the International Institute, the Science Studies Program, and the um, social movement organization on campus, the Green New Deal at UCSD. I also really want to thank um, a a number of different students who are on this session right now at UCSD and other individuals who have offered valuable help with this, this event from here in San Diego all the way to um, East Timor and probably beyond. And I apologize if I'm uh, missing anyone here. Uh, I now wanna give a land, uh, land acknowledgement, which is um, the, an acknowledgement borrowed from uh, the Green New Deal at UCSD, with the hope that this acknowledgement is not treated as some sort of unreflective routine, uh, but rather as an opening for self and collective reflection about being uninvited guests on colonized lands. UCSD is built on the unceded territory of the Kumeyaay Nation, Despite facing centuries of settler greed, genocidal policy, and dehumanizing treatment, the Kumeyaay people maintain their political sovereignty and cultural traditions in the San Diego Tijuana region. We stand in solidarity with the Kumeyaay people, recognize their struggles for recognition and against extractivism, and uplift their stewardship for the land and region where we live, work, study, and love. So now I'd like to um, pass the mic to um, the, the manager of the International House, again, one of our co-sponsors for this event, uh, to Adam McKinney, uh, who is going to say a few words about um, the program at the International House. So um, take it away, Adam. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Um, I'll be really brief. My name is Adam McKinney, and I'm the manager, as mentioned, of the International House here at UC San Diego. Um, iHouse is a living learning community and a globally themed programming hub, but I'm mostly here to just let any UCSD undergrads know um, that your attendance here this afternoon counts toward the Globally Engaged Triton's co-curricular record opportunity, 
and I'll drop um, a link in the chat for those of you who may not be familiar. Um, please feel free to contact me with any questions via chat. Um, and if you're interested in similar events, I encourage you to keep tabs on the iEvents calendar, um, which I will also drop in the chat. But without further ado, I will pass it back to Matthew and look forward to a great program. All right, thanks so much, Adam. So yes, so now um, allow me to uh, introduce you to our roundtable um, facilitator, Professor Joyce Yapno. Um, and I really, really want to um, uh, thank uh, all of the work that um, uh, Joy put into making this event possible. It really, you know, we really couldn't do this without you, Joy. And so thank you very much for, for bringing all these incredible uh, panelists together, um, despite the, you know, the issues with time zones and technology and the like. So, so it's really, really appreci uh, appreciated. Um, Professor Siapno is currently teaching Southeast Asian history, politics, and culture in the Global South Studies program. And in spring quarter, we'll be teaching wilderness and human uh, values in the environmental studies program at Muir College here at UCSD. Um, thank you so much, Joy, again, and, and please take it away. It's an honor and pleasure to introduce the four speakers. Um, they are some of the most courageous, inspiring, wise, transformative leaders on the front lines of environmental and climate justice in Southeast Asia. Creating and building bridges between pure scientific researchers and educators with government, international development, and policymaking, and placing that within a historical context of colonialism, the Cold War, dictatorships, authoritarian regimes, militarization, highly extractive multinational corporations, and conflict over natural resources, not to mention maritime disputes. So I'm just going to read their short bios. <clears throat> Sheila Cornell is a professor at the Graduate School of Journalism, Columbia University. She's also concurrently director of the Stabil Center for Investigative Journalism. Demetrio Amaral Carvalho is the Secretary of State for the Environment, Government of Timor-Leste, Timor. He was the recipient of the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2004 and a co-founder of Fundação Haburas, an environmental NGO in East Timor. <coughs> Dr. Therese Nguyen T. Fong Tam is a senior lecturer in the Faculty of Social Sciences, Universidad Nacional Timor-Leste, UNTL. She is a director of the master's course in community development. Dr. Kim N. B. Nin is currently a senior advisor at the Asia Foundation and formerly served as the Asia Foundation's country representative in Myanmar and Vietnam. So the first question that um, Matt had sent you previously and which you have five minutes each to, to discuss, uh, to, to answer is, what does climate justice mean in Southeast Asia? And um, the second question is, what tools, mechanisms, or strategies do we have at our disposal to achieve it? So I just wanted to mention that um, Deyu said he has to leave. Uh, and I was wondering if it's possible to, um, to you know, change the order, if, if you're all right with that. Is that okay? Is that all right if he goes first or Sheila, is that okay? Uh, Kim, Tom, yes? Okay, um, go ahead, Deo. Thank you, um, Professor Joy. Um, again, good morning, everyone from Team of Leicester, good afternoon. Uh, to everyone there in the United States and also um, uh, in the region of South, um, um, Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm very glad to join you uh, in this morning um, um, conference on um, Southeast Asia student class, especially uh, uh, related to the topic of um, uh, environmental justice. Um, my reflections um, in responding your 
Uh, first question is um, Timor Leste. In the, in the context of Timor Leste, we have, um, when we're talking about um, environmental justice, when we're talking about climate justice, it's, um, it's uh, really strong connected to our past history and the legacy living um, with our people today. Um, remember Timor Leste, um, was a Portuguese colony for five years, um, 500 years. Portuguese uh, uh, discovered Timor Leste or came to Timor Leste uh, using um, their simple, uh, I can say, technology at that time. But uh, they uh, focus on what uh, the the uh, the project um, um, they introduce. Um, the political mercantilism, um, taking all forest resources at that time to um, keep um, um, them survive and also um, um, connecting to um, monarchy uh, uh, regimes in Portugal. And um, in according to the uh, scientific um, um, information. Um, uh, if we read uh, 500 years, uh, uh, the work of Timor Leste, um, only about um, 100 years, um, um, Sandalut that uh, before very popular in the in the regions, uh, come to uh, distinctions and other species related to the mercantilism project. And uh, come close to uh, the century of 19, uh, monarchy regimes collapsed in Portugal and Republican uh, became the, um, into power. And uh, the first time Republican sent um, um, Governor Celestino da Silva, the man introduced coffee plantations in a big um, uh, plantations. And I also introduce, in the same time, introduce. Um, um, I just uh, translated uh, fintas is um, uh, human uh, taxes uh, or fins in English, if I'm not wrong, um, to um, everyone's um, eight years old. Um, and at the times, um, um, local uh, community have to pay. Uh, 30 pataka, it means um, he or she has to work um, up to um, three or four months uh, labor work to have that amount to pay their uh, fintas. Um, and local people, local landowner people uh, became afraid with these introductions because uh, Portuguese also introduced um, uh, new, new um, land regimes uh, called um, Aforamento, um, and from that, um, the landowner gave their land to um, uh, deportados from Mozambique, Bissau, or from Portugal, or even from India, and then changing the landowner's uh, structure in Timor. Um, the new um, deportados come to Timor, became the land, big landowners, landholders in Timor, and then um, uh, Camponesa, uh, small farmers became lose their land. Um, today, uh, from the research, concluded that um, there about 28% of uh, Timorese people depend on coffee economy. But when we're talking about uh, income from coffee, today, um, coffee production has very um, very, very, uh, very low, and coffee market, coffee price in the international market also um, sometimes decline. Um, if we also compare to the situation during the regime of um, dictatorial system under Indonesians, they also uh, bring um, new regimes um, in the coffee economy. Remember, Petadenok was established by military operations groups to, to, um, to um, uh, control coffee markets. And, and I remember very well 
from from 1981 to 1982 before the opens of um, Timor, 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 province of Timor, Timor, Timor. Um, military control people not to bring or transfer coffee from district to Delhi for uh, having have different uh, market opportunity. So that's uh, bring conditions to the people um, not to depend on coffee economy. And today, um, when Portuguese left Timor Leste, we our coffee plantations uh, reach uh, seventy two thousand hectares. Today, only fifty one hectares, and the income for um, coffee farmers only there three hundred dollar per per year. That's uh, um, the legacy of um, uh, colonizations and a dictatorial system apply and develop a multi, I can say multi um, phase um, uh, poverty to a coffee farmer. And um, today, um, if I try, if I can, hello, very short uh, to the measures and the strategy to solve. Um, to solve this type of uh, uh, historical um, uh, injustice, we need um, to have innovative um, um, programs and um, a different type of legal framework to deconstruct uh, this type of um, 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 uh, historical uh, climate and environmental uh, injustice. Um, sorry, sorry, Deo, um, I'm very, very sorry to interrupt you, but um, we're going to talk for five minutes each and then and okay. then we'll get back to you again. Is that all right? Yeah. So, okay. um, okay. so Sheila and then Tom and then Kim. Good. Hi. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening from New York. I'm I'm going to focus. I, I teach at the journalism school, so I'm going to focus on Communicate, communicating and raising public awareness about climate justice issues. Um, we know, of course, that unless public is aware, there can be very few changes in public policy, as well as the behavior of individuals, companies, government agencies, and other actors. So what tools do we have to address the questions that Matthew posed? What tools do we have for relaying information about climate and about climate justice to the wide public and what kinds of information resonate with audiences. So there are some studies that, that show that there is really interest among the public on climate change issues, a wide range of climate and environmental issues. That's, that's the good news. Um, but the bad news is that news audiences, when they are surveyed, say they are not very well informed about global warming and other issues related to climate. In, in the US, a survey done in 2020 by the Yale program on climate change communication showed that fewer than 20% of the news audience is very well informed. And that's the United States, which is a very saturated news media environment. And it's probably even less for many countries in the global South. What we've seen is that news audiences don't see climate news or climate information as connected to their daily lives. What we've also seen around the world, this is from the Reuters Institute's recent study, that many audiences around the world are exhibiting select what they call selective avoidance of the news. Many people feel that the coverage generally, including of climate is negative repetitive, hard to trust, and leaves people feeling powerless. The research on media suggests that audiences want journalists to cover difficult issues, true, but they also want more inspiration uh, and more fun. So how, how do we do this? How do we relate climate information that is not just doom and gloom, but also inspiring and fun? The problem is that structurally, newsrooms are cover climate, climate justice issues in a very episodic way. When there's a controversy over a power plant, a dam, 
a mining company. Coverage is very siloed. Uh, even when climate crisis or climate justice issues affects everything, infrastructure, agriculture, legislation, government departments or agencies, climate is actually everything. And climate can no longer be a siloed beat. We need to see interconnected stories that link, that make the link between climate change and its effects. In a way, all stories are now climate stories. Stories on forest fires and food shortages, on migration, on disaster, on heat related and public health, they all have a climate component. The problem is that journalists, like all citizens, like a basic lack a basic understanding of the science behind climate change. Why, what of the forces that are driving that change and what is at stake in order for us to have a livable planet and how to fix it. So one of the tools that we really need to do is maybe look at how we can better educate and education is not just the journalist role, but all institutions in society, academia, churches, governments, um, civil society, how we can if, if educate our citizens and our journalists on making that links. Because unless citizens make that link between climate change, public policy, and their daily lives, that change, positive change, will not be possible. The good news is that many newsrooms are responding very positively to the climate crisis. The Reuters Institute survey of 303 media leaders in 53 countries done last year found that nearly half of news organizations they surveyed had formed dedicated teams to cover climate. And more than 40% had taken steps to ensure climate is covered by all beats. I'm not sure that is happening in Southeast Asia where climate coverage is still very traditional, very siloed and very episodic. What we need really is a community of journalists and a community of advocates who can put more nuance and more interconnected coverage of disaster, public health, of the economy, questioning development models that stress growth over environmental protection and over social equity. We also need to give more journalists, need to give more voice to the movements pressing for climate justice. And there are many all around Southeast Asia. I was recently in the Philippines and I was in a slum in Manila where I, where I was witnessing a discussion of climate activists together with slum leaders whose main concerns in the past were housing. And they were trying to make the link between um, housing justice uh, and, and climate and environmental justice. We need more coverage of these events. We need people from various sectors with different social justice issues getting together around the issues of climate coverage. We also need to show concrete action and what policy options are available. We need also to show good news and good solutions, not just doom and gloom. We need to empower people with the sense that they have the power to make changes that will have an impact on a global crisis. We need to overcome the sense of powerlessness. So that's my five minutes worth of Thank you so much, Sheila. Sam? Sam? Where's Sam? Good morning, everyone. Um, try try removing your video because we're having a hard time doing it. Um, thank you for University of California, uh, San Diego, and the uh, organization of this event invited me to uh, contribute to this discussion uh, related to um, the first question. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Good 
sorry uh my internet disruption sorry um can you hear me yes we can hear you tom okay um quickly i'm talking um about the first question uh professor Mathieu. uh what does it mean is uh climate change um justice uh, this question um, draw me uh, the the following question, but I will not going to uh, go uh, deeply to those questions. But this is for all of us to think about uh, the climate change justice. Um, we need to know which country are consuming more energy and which countries are consuming consuming less energy, and who discharge more carbon emission, and who are more affected the impact of climate change. Um, so I want to focus more on the vulnerable groups in Timor-Leste. That's what I know more about um, because my uh, research usually uh, cover the difficulties of the uh, farmer women in Timor-Leste. Um, Why I'm talking about this because um, as we, we still remember that um, in the climate justice, uh, the women movement for climate justice in Bali climate change conference in 2007, they have the slogan like this, there is no climate justice without gender justice. Um, why is connect to uh, gender justice? Uh, because the a lot of research, a lot of survey in Timor Leste pointed out the most vulnerable population to climate change is women, children, people with disability, elderly. And um, uh, now it's more than talk about the inequality between women and men. But in here, I, I more focus uh I, I talk about the vulnerable groups uh, especially women because they do in the caring work um for the vulnerable groups they they care for the sick people they care for the disability people and they care for the elderly people as well so um the situation in um of the women in the rural area in timor -Leste, um, I think not only rural area, because when we are facing a natural disaster, all affected, uh, urban area, uh, rural area, all affected. But why I, I, I say um, uh, women are more vulnerable uh, for, for the reason is um, um, poor household in Timor Leste, mostly in the rural area. And uh, women have um, lack of ownership and con lack of control on the access. Uh, they have very limited to alternative livelihoods. And women farmers lack of access to agricultural inputs. And usually they have low literacy, a low education. And mostly they are the one provide the food on the daily table in every household. And they are immediate food providers. So therefore, something happened or uh, the impact of climate change impact directly to, to woman life. The, the, the second question is, uh, what is the strategies to responding to this problem? I think um, for poor people, for, for women, poor women in developing countries, the worst case scenario would be uh, some mitigation policies that force developing countries onto low carbon development paths and without ensuring access to affordable alternative energy sources. I have been doing research on the improved cook stove for the women, and I, I see that um, during my research in 2017, and I see that um, the government do very little 
in terms of supporting or any alternative energy policy to support the vulnerable groups in Timor Leste, especially women. And um, I agree with Professor um, um, Cornell that um, we should, uh, in, as um, community development, um, co uh, we, we are, um, uh, as a um, community development lecturer, and I think in the future, we should raise more voice or organize the community to raise their voice, especially the vulnerable population to raise their voice, mobilize them to raise their voice, to advocate for um, more uh, subsidy on the energy supply for the vulnerable households. And also we need gender analysis in the carbon footprints that also help policymakers to identify the most effective strategies for changing the energy use behavior and the raising awareness is also important in the community level because um, climate change is connected to every of us and we need to raise the, the awareness in the community level to change uh, the behavior that can uh, live uh, more harmony with, the, with our environment, like a lesser uh, uh, cutting trees for, for selling firewoods or uh, burning the grass during the, the, uh, the cultivation uh, season. And also we need to empower community and uh, improve their knowledge about growing different crops and finding alternative livelihoods um, in, in their farming. And also uh, directing a more aid funded adaptation projects to poor women and subsidize healthcare, reproductive health uh, re related to breast cancer for women and other type of illness caused by climate change. That's all uh, for my uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. Kim? Uh, thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to join you all today uh, with this uh, discussion. So I will come to this from the perspective of someone who's been working in international development for the past for more than 20 years. Um, and, uh, and if we take Matt's question and go back to the basics of what constitute climate justice or environment justice, um, just the notion that it acknowledges the the adverse effects that climate change or environmental change issues have on different populations. That would allow us a window to discuss both internally uh, developments within a country in terms of development process, but also externally uh, on, a, on a global level. Um, so on, on a, you know, I will tell you that um, more than 20 years ago, when I first started in development, environmental issues are very much a, um, a niche area. Uh, we talk about education, we talk about, uh, we talk about gender issues, we talk about governance issues, uh, but environment was very much viewed as a, um, uh, you know, as, 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 as um, a, a, a sort of a, as a smaller side area rather than front and center of the development process. Um, and so in that regard, how much things have changed, uh, things have really changed in the past decade, I would say, uh, to see slowly the, 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 the one thing that Sheila is very correct is that the rising awareness that has permeate societies and communities in many parts from Southeast Asia over environmental issues that I think really made a significant impact, uh, you know, uh, as a precursor to, to understanding and accepting the changes coming with climate issues. Um, so 
on issue, on on a set of issues as complicated as 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 uh, as this, uh, it, any strategy we we look at would have to be multi prong, numerous strategies at one time, and a lot of that is cumulative. And what I would say is that over the years, what I've seen is the the, the sort of the investment in building civil society, the investment in building connections among groups, in networking, uh, in regional groups, uh, in regional groupings, in, in supporting the media, uh, perhaps initially was not so focused on environment, but that built the inst institutional structure outside of government for these kind of conversation, these kind of work to, to exist. Um, uh, uh, in, in, uh, I, I happen to um, uh, live, uh, to, to been very honored to have lived in places like Vietnam and, and Myanmar with very different kind of, of development uh, entry points uh, in, 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 in these processes. Um, and that is something that perhaps we can come back to when we uh, have the opportunity to open up the conversation uh, among ourselves. Um, but here I see sort of, uh, sort of there, there's, there's efforts at the community and at the societal level in terms of raising awareness. But over time, the sophistication of some of these strategies has really grown. Uh, in the past decade, for example, the push in civil society was much more focusing on um, not simply activism, but also focusing on policy making process uh, of the past decade has really made a significant difference in terms of bringing different voices to the table um, in, in, in engaging with the government, for example. Um, government themselves uh, have also taken on board many more issues related to the environment and, 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 uh, and climate change than ever before. Uh, and here, uh, if, we, if we want to take a hopeful approach, as Sheila has, has, has pointed out, there's really opportunity here to really engage uh, on, on on societal side with the government side, um, you know, for, for uh, policy making, for engaging in solutions. Um, in a number of places where I, where, where, I, uh, where I work, one see often that governments sometimes are so busy dealing with um, the governance side of issues with the day-to-day -day work that sometimes they don't have the capacity to look at solutions. And that is where that I can really see where civil society work can really make a big difference um, here. And, and, and those opportunities uh, exist. Um, but as the climate change issues um, grew um, more um, dominant, uh, this, this has also raises all sorts of um, uh, conflict between government and civil society groups, for example. And so in many parts of Asia, uh, you know, environmental defenders are some are, you know, are now uh, increasingly view in a much more political ways than, than that used to be the case. Uh, and so in places like Vietnam or Myanmar, um, they, are often, uh, they are often uh, uh, silent uh, uh, through a number of different measures, including uh, long jail sentences. Um, so, so we are looking at, at, at perhaps a moment in which there are fundamental structural change in the global environment in terms of the growth, pro in, the, in terms of the growth model that we've been looking at, uh, in, in terms of how climate change is impacting societies and, 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 and government. Uh, and this also will entail significant um, structural issues that each country will have to address. And this is where you see potential conflict uh, deep conflict can also arise in ways that we haven't seen previously. Uh, so, um, where, where, whereas where, where we've seen um, uh, in 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 the past, um, youth uh, youth movement in, in in Southeast Asia, I think, has also made a really significant impact uh, here. And so, increasingly, we're focusing on addressing newer generation. Uh, much more savvy with communication technology, using the current technology to build platform to actually, in many ways, they're becoming much more sophisticated than even government agencies uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of providing data, in terms of providing uh, 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 resources, uh, information. Um, but oftentimes where we see, um, uh, where we see the potential for this is, is, is uh, often isolated. The opportunity here is uh, one of the strategy is really is to build platform and linkages uh, among these groups uh, with a wide ranging 
uh, a set of, of, of potential solutions and information and databases to come together in order to have impact on what government will and will not do. Uh, the other thing I would say, and I think this is a really important forum, is that um, for as many years as I've worked in, in, in international development, there's always a really um, not sufficient linkages between academia and what, and what civil society can do. Uh, and I come out of, of, of academic life. Uh, and it always struck me how that is something that we can do so much more uh, than, than, than we have been able to. Uh, and this is a, such a perfect forum to, to discuss how those kind of collaborations can happen. Activists oftentimes don't have the time to do detailed analysis or to gather information. Although, I, as I mentioned, this has been changing quite a bit uh, in the past decade. Uh, but how do we bring this sort of longer range analysis uh, to the discussion that actually would that actually would make an impact on populations and groups uh, that can really make a significant difference and also contribute to uh, wherever opportunity may lie in uh, providing support to government as they also seek to deal with really difficult circumstances facing themselves and 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 their populations. Um, so I'm hopeful in that regard. Although uh, no matter what we do. Uh, ultimately, we are also look at the politics of countries. Um, you know, also we've mentioned in this conversation already the issue about authoritarianism, uh, issues about um, uh, uh, the the ability of of, of engagement, of, of freedom of uh, conversation and discussion and, and and engagement in in civic life, uh, and that will continue to be the case. And unless we continue to address that. Um, then the larger issues of climate change will also be difficult to uh, to bring. Uh, you know, it, it will be difficult, not also in terms of, of awareness, but also in terms of solutions. Um, and uh, especially in places where you look at Vietnam, and uh, it's a major coastline, and we are looking at significant impact on that whole coastline, and even the major cities of Vietnam are looking at the potential of being underwater. Uh, in the next few decades, um, we turn to look in the case of Myanmar, uh, and um, that is a you know, and that is a country now under authoritarian government. Uh, environment defenders can hardly have a place to have a uh, to have a say. Um, and in addition, the kind of natural resources that Myanmar is blessed with is now being exploited. In fact, even for the green economy that the global and uh, the global world is moving toward, uh, there's exploitation going on there as well without addressing the political side. Um, so let me leave it at that and uh, return this to Joy for uh, the larger conversation. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that. Thank you so much, Kim. And I think we still have a bit of time before Deo has to leave us. Um, so I'm gonna go back to Deo for the second question because I don't think you were able to answer it. Uh, the What tools, mechanisms, or strategies do we have at our disposal to achieve environmental and climate justice? And um, as a government official, do you have the capacity? Because one, uh, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, um, the first thing we have to do is changing our paradigm from being victim to the climate change to a perspective as a leader. Leader should bring solutions. We not only living and criticize our historical legacy cause our uh, environmental injustice. We need to find opportunity to, to solve the problems. And um, uh, one of the solutions as leader uh, we need to reform and engage a global multilateralism corporations in environment, um, related to environment. We have uh, real conventions um, um, such as uh, United Nations Convention on Biodiversity, United Nations Convention Framework on Climate Change, United Nations Convention on Combating Desertification. These all international corporations that we see, we can engage more and bring uh, more um, opportunity and capitalize resources to solve uh, environmental problem in Timor-Leste. During my leadership as an uh, environmental uh, state secretary, I am able to um, negotiate it uh, in different uh, uh, opportunity and um, 
um, um, we have been um, more fun to um, to Timor Leste related to climate change and environment. For example, um, the global environmental facility, a specific a specific funds established under Rio Convention to solve uh, environmental problem in uh, global arena. Um, we have already um, in, uh, cap captured more than five, 50 million. And the Green Climate Fund, my ambition is by, before I ending my missions, um, if I possible, um, capturing 100 million US to solve environmental problem. Up to today, we already mobilized 55 million for different type of um, environmental um, and climate um, related activity. Uh, in terms of uh, negotiations for um, um, changing uh, the context of uh, um, uh, the contents of um, uh, conventions, we strongly involved in uh, LDCs group um, and seats and LDCs group um, 44, 44 member in that uh, group. Uh, we not only um, participated. Um, as member, but we show our leadership in uh, leading the um, 42, 44 um, uh, seats and LDCs group negotiating the interests of uh, 44 countries on um, climate uh, funds, on different uh, technology transfer, uh, capacity development, etc. Um, we also um, uh, bring opportunity to the construct. Uh, injustice conditions to uh, our coffee farmer, as I mentioned before. Um, today, Timor-Leste government allocated um, 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 to my office um, um, two million to support um, initia initiative from coffee farmer for the carbonizations. We, Timor-Leste, um, the, the global trend is uh, raised to zero. Timor Leste, from the climate change impact, we have already um, uh, affected by the sea level rise. Sea level rise today affected Timor Leste 0.05 centimeters a year. And um, our emission is very low 0.003 percent from the global emissions. So Timor Leste, no need to raise to zero. Uh, the global leader call for race to zero for um, and also um, uh, commitment to achieve uh, 30 by 30 mean 30% uh, of the global uh, spare conserve in oceans and also in terrestrial area. Timor-Leste today we already achieved 17, 17% of land conservations and 10% of our oceans being declared as no take zone. We already come close to 30%, 27%. So we, in terms of um, um, shifting our um, uh, paradigm from being victim to leaders, we already demonstrated, um, 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 I think, um, a very um, uh, huge uh, example I have mentioned. Uh, there are um, conditions like um, 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 funding, mobilize more funding to uh, LDCs. Um, um, the North Group and the big consumer of energy um, from uh, conference of party, climate change, biodiversity, pledging to increase their fund to solve environmental problem, but it's still moving very slow. And we um, associated with the group pressure group like LDCs, SEEDS groups to make our voice more strong. And we hope um, um, by um, strengthening uh, global multilateralism on environment, we can also bring more uh, opportunity to uh, serve um, LDC's country in the South um, East Asia group. Um, uh, in terms of um, intervention to coffee farmers, um, for example, um, the amount um, we invest um, this year's 
we able to plant 7 million to 10 million trees. That's if we calculate it to carbon market, very huge. Yeah? Uh, coffee forest, coffee plantations already seen as a secondary ecosystem, provide ecosystem services as a sources of water, as a sources of soil fertility and sources of income to the community. So if we restore our coffee plantation, we also restore our environment. But um, more than that, we increase Timor-Leste capacity sec uh, in uh, sequestering carbon. Uh, and from sequestering carbon, we can promote our farmers' coffee, our farmers' coffee sage tree to um, international market uh, for coffee for for coffee uh, for carbon trading. And today we already mobilize uh, from carbon trading. I hope um, uh, by the end of this year we can bring 30 million for coffee for uh, uh, for carbon trading in Timor Leste. Yeah, one of the example is installing installing of uh, 1.5 million uh, um, saving energy cooking stove. Remember uh, the women affected by indoor pollutions because our traditional cooking system. If we can improve um, saving energy cooking stove, we also um, will contribute to um, um, improve our health index, including. Um, distributions of water filter to uh, to uh, public uh, health issues related to poor environmental conditions one is uh, indoor pollution another one is consume of um, uh, uh, what called poor water um, treatment um, to the public so by distributing um, one uh, by distributing to every household water filter we will also reduce kidneys problems and um, other health problems related to um, poor water conditions. Um, I think um, Timor-Leste have no obligation to uh, pressure our emissions. Um, we always, um, in the negotiation, we stated many times the Green Climate Fund, the Global Environmental Facility, Adaptation Fund, and other funds allocated to solve environmental problem, including support the poor and the LDCs groups is not a um, grant. It has to be seen as historical responsibility for their uh, exploitations of um, natural resources in uncontrolled way in the past. And today, uh, if we want to build a just uh, planet, North South corporations in different way need to build. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dio. Thank you. Sheila? Yes. Joy, you're muted. Yeah, we have uh, until 5.15 before the question and answer. So um, did you want to say more about, you know, maybe do an uptake on any of the other questions uh, with Tom and Kim as well? Um, I think I, I, I agree with a lot that has been said. Certainly, the gender dimension of climate needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And and I think that there are all of these social justice movements and, and gender movements, but they haven't been linked to the movement for climate justice. I think what we what perhaps needs to happen is for this movement to coalesce around a climate agenda. I think that's happening already in some spheres, but but I I, I agree with, with um, Kim that the younger generation is much more attuned to environmental and climate justice issues. I think my generation was more um, mobilized by social justice or pro-democracy, anti-authoritarian anti uh, movements, political movements, but I think there we have a younger generation who's in fact taking the lead in many of the movements for for climate justice using as kim said very innovative methods digital social media innovative protests 
um, to raise awareness about climate, climate justice issues. So, so I think it's great that we have many young people here, but maybe we should hear from them about, you know, what they see are, I mean, the nature of social movements have changed so much because of the nature of global communications and technology. Um, there's varying uh, schools of thought about whether that's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. That maybe people feel that when they tweet something or post something on Instagram, that that's equivalent to political action. But how do we sustain energies for climate justice movements? Because I think they are very important in bringing about change in, in both locally as well as globally in terms of, of climate justice. Um, I just would like, I would like to add, hello. Yeah, um, relates, uh, related to um, the, the, the emission in um, Timor-Leste is clear that we are in the space of a pre-industry society. Yeah? We don't have a lot of industry in, in the country and our emission is still very low. But what I concern is the deforestation. The, the region around uh, Delhi, the, a lot of community and from the research of my student in from their, their thesis writing, they, they did a lot of writing about uh, deforestation. It means the people cutting trees for commercial purpose, for um, fuel, for domestic fuel. So it means that the cutting trees contribute to a lot to deforestation. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, the, the government intervention uh, during this year is, uh, uh, is an effort. I think this would be a uh, more collective effort. It's not from the, the government, but also uh, from, from the community and raising awareness on to, bo to looking for the alternative livelihoods not only depend on the five wood uh, selling. Huh? And um, another thing I, um, I also um, uh, uh, see here is the, the budget of the government uh, for the agricultural sector uh, every year is very small. So that's why I agree with uh, Kim Nguyen that uh, policy making is important. Uh, for example, I give you the budget check in 2023 um, for education, for health, only 5% of the budget. check. Water and sanitation, only 1.3%. Uh, agriculture, only 2%. I suppose the agriculture should, should, should um, uh, uh, invest more pop check on that because now the, 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 the most of the population, most of the farmers, depend on the and and uh, rain um uh rain uh, uh the the water the only water they depend on the rain uh, water not 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 the irrigation because the irrigation system in our country is uh, is not uh, underdeveloped and also uh is not functioned very well so i mean that the the investment in agriculture is also the solution to to secure the food insecurity in 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 our country, so it's me climate change is something is not uh, one one part of the the government working, but on it's a interlink, it's a holistic approach it's from education, health. I think every sector every sector in 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 our country should should talk about should should think about our climate change, health also think about climate change. Education also think about climate change. Infrastructures think about climate change. Agriculture also think about climate change. It's not only the Secretary of State of, uh, of climate change uh, talk about that. Thank you very much. I yes. just want to add two points. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes. I just want to add two points. One is I want to follow up to um, 
to Minister Dayo point on uh, on uh, MNC multinational corporations. Uh, but I want to take that at the national level because there 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 is room here to work with local business community with national business community in this effort as well. Um, over time, I've, I've also seen that the, the business communities uh, have become much more interested on, uh, you know, in, in, in these kind of issues than before. And there has been successful efforts in Vietnam, for example, working with the, with the business associations uh, and looking at how to address or how to even, even be um, ready for, for natural disasters. Uh, because through dealing with business communities in many ways, you have another angle in addressing these issues with the, with the, um, with the workers uh, community, for example, and with the local communities where these kind of impact can really affect local communities and their livelihoods. So, so I really, I really um, would want to emphasize that there is a, a, a strategy of working with the business community uh, within these countries to, uh, to address these issues. Uh, so, that's, so that's one area I wanna highlight. The second is that I often find that these kind of strategy or solution can be very country specific or community specific, but, but it does lend itself to potential opportunities or lesson learns or, or adaptation across Southeast Asia that we often sometimes don't get sufficient models uh, to examine. Um, and so, and so, one of the area where where a number of groups have tried to do, and I think I think will need more effort and more uh, as as things change, is how do we how do we address these issues at the community level? Where has it been successful? What factors allow it to be successful? And that can help cascading that kind of learning across the region. Um, and I think a lot more of that uh, could be done. Um, a sense of a sense of a sense of uh, uh, sharing information, um, and 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 as 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 we mentioned earlier, things are changing, and so strategies are changing in ways that uh, sometimes we are not fast enough to to pick up. Um, I just tell you for one for one example, for example, in Myanmar, where where in many ways it's, it's it is probably the most dire situation in Southeast Asia at the moment regarding uh, environmental issues. Um, and yet, uh, young groups of, of, of uh, NGOs and environment activists have been able to use a, a satellite imagery, for example, to document changes in deforestation um, in order to, to, you know, in, in their own effort, in, in order to document what is happening uh, in the country. Um, using, using uh, and, and then obviously social media and other platform becoming a way in which they can communicate. So there are ways in which these things are happening that at a pace that we, uh, that, 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 um, uh, that we can uh, help to uh, pick up and to uh, expand across the region. Um, and I think that also helped to, to uh, you know, to emphasize the creativity that exists uh, in the region in addressing a number of these issues uh, under a variety of conditions and political contexts uh, that, that, that can really help to inspire. Uh, and perhaps uh, in, in, in this arena, uh, Sheila, media can help to, to make this an exercise in ways that is, um, uh, you know, is much more um, uh, uh, inspirational and fun uh, to the readers, for example, but that, that can also contribute greatly to what's happening across the region. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, Matt, should we open it now to question and answer? Do you wanna take Yeah, some? that sounds great, thank you. Um, let's do that. So for anyone in the audience um, who would like to ask a question or share a comment or a story um, with, with us and with uh, any of the uh, for panelists, please um, feel free to do so by uh, raising your digital hand on Zoom or putting in a comment in the in the chat. Um, so yeah, the floor the floor is now open. Um, maybe I can, uh, unless someone raises their hand very very quickly here, maybe I can chime in with a with a quick question. Um, first, thank you everyone um, 
Kim, Tam, Sheila, Deo for, for sharing your perspectives, your, um, your knowledge with us. This is extraordinarily valuable. Um, I don't know, is, uh, is Deo still with us or did he have to run, did he have to run out? I think he had to run out. Okay. okay. Yeah, he said he had to leave after an hour, right? So, okay. Um, so I guess uh, one, one question I have has to do with, uh, I think it's something sort of uh, piggybacking on something I think Sheila said there in the second round about, um, you know, so many earlier generations were um, influenced and inspired by questions of social justice, economic justice, anti-authoritarianism, democracy, uh, racial justice, economic justice, like all that whole sort of social realm, um, which was so often juxtaposed against or um, separated from the kind of environmental realm, right? The, the sort of environmental activism. Um, and, you know, I'm just wondering if, if anyone would like to share their thoughts about how we kind of can um, bridge those two worlds a little bit better because my, you know, I think, I think you're absolutely right, Sheila, that younger generations are kind of um, uh, very much, uh, um, you know, inspired by or, in, or interested in sort of achieving, achieving climate justice. And of course, for those generations, climate justice, it's not, it's not about like some nature out there. I mean, certainly there are some where it's like wilderness protection and, you know, national parks and be in nature. Um, especially in places like the United States, where that's very common still. Um, but for the most part, these younger generations see climate justice as very much entwined with these questions of social and economic justice and, you know, anti-colonialism, decolonization, et cetera. Um, uh, but I think there's still, right, there's still, I, I see it in, in my, when I teach that, for example, I'll just give you a story. When I teach history of Mexico, I have the students do this final project where they get to choose a particular kind of set of problems with contemporary Mexico. And, you know, I, I, it's borders and immigration, it's sort of class and economic questions of inequality, um, it's democracy, it's gender. And, and then it's, you know, I have one for climate and environment. And that's the one that, that, that gets the fewest. You know, and so I'm, and I kind of see this, I see a lot of energy, but I also see limits to it. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts from the perspective of Southeast Asia or your own work um, about maybe how we can do a better job of bridging these, these realms. Thank you. I think that's a very that's kind of tough because I I on one hand people do see the connections, but on the other hand, um, this complex connections it's hard to make kind of a simple slogan or something that will mobilize that's easy to mobilize. I mean certainly the the issues of the disproportionate impact of the climate crisis on women and communities of color, on poor people, is a way to link climate issues with social justice issues. And I think some of that energy has to come from the communities most affected by, by it. And the problem is these communities do not have the voice, their concerns are not amplified, and very often, they are also not making those interconnections that would make their issues resonate with the larger with the larger public. So. Thank you. Um, so we do have some uh, uh, one hand up. Um, Elisaria, Bebe Gomez, um, would you like to go yes. ahead? Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity um, on Matthew. Uh, I'm Elisiare Fepe Gomez, working at La Homutuk. 
one of uh, Timor-Leste local organizations, who is also uh, give lots of advocacy uh, in regards to climate justice. So my questions here, first of all, I would like to say that I'm agree with Manatam, that here, for example, Timor-Leste, we do have a lot of uh, conditions of social conditions, especially uh, now we also facing in, uh, food insecurity here. But at the same time, the government promoting uh, mitigation, as Mondeo mentioned about, uh, we are trying to adapt, adapt uh, with the with uh, doing a carbon farming here in our country, which is is very good for us to adapt and then uh, mitigate that uh, to to mitigate that condition. However, my question is like. Um, once when we, we ask people to like, uh, we promoting them to, to cultivate those things. I mean, especially like trees that can, uh, uh, trees that can absorb carbon, but it's not good for the soil. And of course that uh, will take out all of the productive lands. And how can uh, we ensure that uh, this kind of people, I mean, the, uh, in, in my context here is vulnerable people can survive uh, when when uh, they now are facing of uh, food insecurity, but at the same time they need to they need to fulfill uh, those agenda from from uh, from international agency who work with uh, Timor Leste government to to plant trees or any, any any kind of carbon farming method. And another another point of view is about uh, we do, maybe this question is for all of us, uh, especially the speakers uh, of today. Okay, we as a tiny country, it is good for us to, uh, to have a pre preparation uh, for our future, but how about those big country? Because as we know that uh, all international agreement that Timor-Leste also being a part of that, uh, showing that uh, only agreement also cannot Make those big country uh, change their 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 uh, their uh, their pers uh, not uh, not not notion, but uh, change their 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 habit in producing uh, uh, fossil. Uh, what do you say? Uh, emissions. Uh, it's not it's not an obligation for them. So we saw that until now the production of CO two until now still increase and, and it seems higher because of their uh, ambitions on, on, on want to take lots of profit, but then uh, sacrifice those tiny country to, to, to continuing um, planting trees. It's a kind of like we fulfill their gaps and then they continue to produce. How can we, how can we say about climate justice if those big country cannot take their real actions? So I'm 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 I apologize, I'm apologize because I'm too frontal in this, but but as a tiny country, I don't want to like uh, I don't uh, I'm not agreeing on 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 continuing sacrificing our people that still lack of everything like social services, but then we have to uh, fulfill those uh, interests from um, agenda from big countries that supporting us via via those. Uh, international agency like Union Europe and other other. Thank you, Mohan Matthew. So maybe we can take a few more a few more questions um, here in the chat because I don't see anybody else's hands up. Um, Pilar Medina is asking, um, what are your thoughts on talking about the climate crisis with more marginalized communities in a non-scientific way? I helped with work on a literary anthology called Harvest Moon, 
that talked about the cli climate crisis through the use of literature and photography. Do you think that uh, there are other ways that we can effectively communicate and mobilize people to engage with environmental activism through other creative means like popular culture or other forms of art? Well, I think, I think definitely um, theater, films, um, even dance, uh, music are ways to uh, talk about climate, to educate climate in the non, call it non scientific, maybe it's scientific, but it's not, you know, as, as the research has found, that is both inspiring and fun. Um, I definitely think so. And, and I think increasingly communities are becoming aware of that because it's affecting, you know, their livelihoods, their farms, their fishing villages, all of that. I think try um, talking to them about the connections between, um, between say uh, droughts or floods, disaster and environmental justice issues. I think making those connections and make and showing that to them is very important in mobilizing communities for, for greater action. But I, I disagree that there's no, um, you know, Elisaria, there, there is a movement now for climate reparations um, and, and for, and there are certain governments like the prime minister of Barbados is taking that lead. There's, there are people, there are heads of state, there are organizations all around the global south um, demanding reparations from the northern countries that produce most of the emissions that are causing a warming climate. There are there are movements around that, but but you're right. I mean, there's not there are movements, but um, there is no global consensus. And the global consensus is hard to read. And it's hard, but. We've seen it happen. Change does come over time. Uh, and the climate cataclysms that were happening, just as the Second World War brought about a, the end of the Second World War, brought about global change in terms of a recognition of human rights. Maybe the climate disasters that we are experiencing will somehow force a global consensus and the need to do something drastic about climate, but do we really need uh, massive disasters to bring us to our senses? And who's going to suffer the most from, um, it's usually the poor, the poor countries that suffer the most from climate linked natural or man-made disasters, sadly. I, mean, I, I, it, I I'll just follow up with Sheila that I, I do think that it is, um, I feel like there has actually the movement for climate reparation is actually has been much more um, at the front of the conversation uh, than ever before. So it feels to me it, it's a hopeful moment. The difficulty is probably that the global the, 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 the global communities right now is 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 um, is dealing with so many crises, um, warfare, pandemic issues, and the like. Um, so I think I think there are clearly hesitation on in terms of cost, but it just seems like the conversation has been taken up in a way that uh, that I didn't think uh, you know uh, uh, was possible before. So I, I really do think there's a moment of hope. We, 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 we have to continue pushing on that agenda uh, and, and see where it goes. But uh, it, it, for me, it feels like it's a more hopeful moment now than before. In terms of using other strategies, other communication strategies, absolutely. Uh, in some places we, we've used, I've seen um, children's book being used very effectively because again, you're talking about a younger generations. Uh, getting getting engaged in 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 those issues, but but the other side of the coin is that 
uh, young people tend to be the best educators of an older generation like their parents. And we've seen this happen, say, in campaigns around uh, anti-smoking, for example, uh, that it's the younger generation that's really pushed their parents to make the change. Uh, and so, uh, and so uh, uh, taking off from that, I've seen useful um, uh, and effective strategies of uh, you know, reaching a younger generation to get at an older generation uh, to bring them on board in terms of issues and, and, and impact. Um, so definitely, uh, I agree with Sheila completely and, 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 with, uh, and, and with you um, that one needs a wide variety of ways to reach people um, in ways that, that, that are um, uh, that easier for them to take on board. And, and in many ways, you know, for these kind of issues, it really is go back for many, in many culture, many societies to something that are pretty fundamental. Uh, many, many many of these issues already exist in 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 uh, folklores, um, you know, in stories passed down from generations. So uh, in some way, it's quite it's quite a natural take to 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 make the link uh, between traditions and 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 uh, and the large impact of of, of climate change. Um, Great, thank you. Um, I think we probably have time for a couple more, a couple more other questions. Um, and I do see two more in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and read them. Um, Kathleen asks, um, do you have any advice for people who may not be going into careers that directly tackle environmental or climate justice issues, but still want to stay knowledgeable about the subject and effectively help raise awareness to their colleagues. And then a second question from Gavin um, is about the current extractivist colonialism happening in places like the Congo, um, particularly around these um, uh, these issues of, of green growth that um, now I'm not sure who is who is talking about that among the panelists, but that was definitely raised uh, in the first part of this this discussion, this roundtable. Um, so Gavin wonders, the mining of cobalt has resulted in child slavery and extremely harsh working conditions. How do we fight back? Cobalt being one of these minerals that's very valuable and in, in, in that is, is a component of um, the batteries used to store um, electrical you know, power from, from uh, you know, wind farms and solar farms um, and batteries like Tesla's you know, battery. Um, so the mining of cobalt has resulted in child slavery and extremely harsh working conditions. How do we fight back and raise awareness against huge companies like Tesla, Apple, et cetera? What can we do? What are the solutions? Big questions, of course. Big question. <laughs> well, we can take um, we can take lessons from campaigns, similar campaigns that have worked in the past. For example, the campaign against blood diamonds, the mining of blood diamonds, has resulted in sort of a global mechanism for looking at the supply chain and ensuring that the diamonds that are sold in the international it's not perfect but it does has made an improvement in ensuring that the diamonds sold in the international market do not come from, from conflict areas. Uh, we've seen a similar change in, in opioids, at least here in the US, you know, where, where big companies have been brought to court and sued and have had to pay massive amounts of money for you know, their marketing, aggressive marketing of addictive opioids medicine. We've seen success in tobacco, for example, in the campaign in the global, it takes time, but we've seen those successes and that, that gives us hope and it should, it should give us hope. I mean, we've seen successes in looking at the supply chain in the fashion industry where now the big fashion companies are looking at where their garments are being manufactured and whether these comply with safety and good labor and working conditions. So definitely raising the, it always the key is raising public awareness, mobilizing the publics, um, guilting big companies or governments, making this an issue that is urgent and that is moral. 
you know, that this it's immoral to do this. I mean, the campaigns against slavery back in the 19th century, 18th and 19th centuries, were really campaigns about morality. That is this, uh, and, and making this both, both an urgent issue and a moral issue, and an issue that has grave consequences on the lives of, of real people. And so we, we can learn from all these past movements in the past and these successes should give all of us hope that together we can do something about, about you know, whether it's my, mining of cobalt or, or, the, or um, the use of fossil fuels, et cetera. Can I also say that um, to the question, to the previous question about what we can do, um, you know, even if this is not a field you go into, uh, if, even if this is not your career, I thought about that a lot uh, just in recent uh, uh, in the recent years when 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 there's so many issues uh, uh, revolving around us because we live in such an inter interconnected world, uh, and at the same time given the amount of sort of difficult issues that come up sometime, it is really difficult to imagine what you can do. Uh, stay engaged. Um, I think more than ever, we are all, if, if, if this is the moment, we are environmentalists now, uh, because it's no longer, uh, as when Sheila and I were coming up, uh, uh, you know, in our career, that this is uh, something separate. It is now very much part of our lives, part of the conversation, part of humanity, uh, part of development process. Um, so, uh, being, you know, the personal is the political. Uh, so I, I would say that that's how, that's how, uh, it has been helpful for me to conceptualize how do I, uh, not only in my own work, uh, focusing on these issues, but also in my own, uh, personal life and engagement with those around me, uh, in terms of, in terms of, uh, remaining engaged and remaining, um, uh, involved in the issues and 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 there's so much information available now uh, that that is accessible um, and to and you know maintain maintaining the knowledge base and maintaining a way to engage with people around you I think is is critically important. There's a question from Matilda here. Yes. Yes. Mati, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful and lively discussion on such important topics. I've, I've been listening and thinking, I, I'm working on tourism in Mexico, and I'm familiar with, you know, discussions. I'm familiar on how unfamiliar discussions of tourism and climate change are in Latin America. And I was wondering for Timor and other parts in Southeast Asia, if the conversation about climate change happens when people talk about tourism in the political arena, in the academic arena, or in schools. So I was, I was looking forward to hear your perspectives on is this a conversation happening or not? And, 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 and thinking about, well, with the opening of Timor now for more international tourism, this is gonna be an important conversation moving forward. Um, I, I was also curious to learn a little bit more about, you know, what what sort of pedagogies are in place, maybe in school settings, um, to talk about climate change. Do do they use the word climate change, or you refer to, you know, natural hazards, or how is people on the ground, and particularly kids, you know, in 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 school settings, referring to the climate crisis or they talk about climate crisis or climate justice or sustainability what, what are the words that are sounding there thank you thank you matide um i will um uh, answer your question related to uh, to what knowledge uh, i i have about a uh, primary school secondary school uh, in timor leste um uh, so far in the in the basic education uh, uh, related to the how to say um, uh, student councils in the schools 
so they um, they was trained the the student uh, to do um, school gardening. Uh, they they plant vegetables so they can consume uh, for their um, for their snack uh, during the class and also uh, to raise awareness on the the environmental issues. But I think um, the 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 main curriculum uh, I I I uh, I don't have uh, much knowledge about uh, how the uh, they they insert the the climate change issue in the curriculum. I'm I'm not sure, but uh, in terms of extracurricular activities in the school, yes, there there is. Um, in um, in our department, uh, we uh, we talk about climate change issues and uh, students interested to do uh, research on this topic. There is, but I'm not sure uh, the other faculty in the other uh, department because I, I know uh, the curriculum in, in my department. I know that we have uh, um, uh, climate. We we have the uh, we we encourage the student to think a uh, uh, holistic way, a uh, holistic approach to, to everything, uh, not only the linear approach. So um, natural uh, nature, live harmony with nature is uh, one part of community development principle. We cannot do development, but we harm our environment. So. Um, uh, sustainable development. We, we we had a lecture, and also most of our students uh, who are um, uh, environmental activists as well, and also uh, work in civil society a lot. So they, they know very well what to do. No, but uh, I think the the scale of work this month is not not scaled up yet. But uh, they are starting to mobilize the the committee to. Uh, work on um, a small uh, projects, how to reserve the water, how to uh, do the water conservation, uh, apply traditional uh, customs to, um, to, uh, to, to ban the committee to cut trees. There's a, a going on um, a movement going on in the community level at, at bottom up level. Um, I think, um, what else? I, I forgot the other questions. It's about school curriculum and anything else. Uh, I forgot the other question. No, that's really helpful. And I think it happens here, those conversations in schools, also in extracurricular ways. Yes. Yeah, yeah. and my other question was re regarding tourism, but it's just like our conversations on climate change happening related to you know, potential future corporations coming to Timor as it's Actually, as um, in, in terms of uh, tourism, uh, we still have, um, uh, I, I'm not so pessimistic, but uh, still underdeveloped uh, because of our infrastructure that uh, uh, prevent uh, people to, to come to, uh, to, to visit some uh, location because of the the road still very bad, and also the service. The service is still a lot of people complaining about the services. It means that the tourism sector, I think, still a lot of thing to do, but also still a lot of chance uh, to talk about more about um, community uh, tourism. It means community the one organize, community the one take care of their their, their environment, community the one. Uh, benefit from the tourism. That's, uh, I think, uh, a, a, in civil society still, uh, we are advocating for, for, for that uh, a model of tourism. Mary, I think ecotourism is a movement that's been around for quite some time in Southeast Asia. And it seems to me that that is, that is seeing, uh, you know, a much more thoughtful transformation now in places, uh, uh, you know, like Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar, you, you, you're seeing conversation around ecotourism. 
uh, and 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 effort to try to figure out models that would work because oftentimes it, it's either too simple or it doesn't actually benefit the local community. So a lot more of those conversations are, are being had now uh, around models of ecotourism that would work. Uh, secondly, um, I think uh, climate change has been used in Southeast Asia for a long time now. Uh, Sustainability is certainly a word that that a term, a concept that resonate with a lot of people. Um, one term that I really like coming out of my work, my years living in Myanmar, uh, which I hope we get picked up in other places. But I just thought it's a lovely phrase um, uh, from one of the uh, civil uh, society leaders there. He referred to um, mindful markets. Uh, which I thought was a very lovely phrase. How do we construct mindful markets in which you get benefit uh, for market activity, but that would also benefit the the the, the larger uh, beneficiaries? Uh, so all of these terms that are being used in 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 uh, you know it used to be I remember in early days to say um, climate change was actually quite sensitive. And a lot of the countries in the region didn't want that term to be used, but I don't think that's an issue now. I think all government recognize it. And it's now been used so much globally uh, that, that in some ways, uh, another hopeful point that we can make is that um, climate change is now an accepted uh, uh, issue, uh, no longer debated, uh, at least in Southeast Asia. Um. May I add one point about my little experience that when I visit Cebu in the Philippines, uh, one question I'm asking about the fish supply in Cebu, and because Cebu is around uh, uh, a big island in the Philippines and Manacho, you know, and uh, I'm asking the, the local people there, so how do you uh, get the fish? Uh, how do you buy? Uh, uh, fish, fish uh, supply from where? Is it from Cebu? No. They said that the fish is not from Cebu, but from the other island. And I said, why? Uh, you you have a history of very great fishing in, in, in Cebu. And they, they said that because the, the tourism is growing now in Cebu, Cebu, and uh, the fishermen, um using the boat to um uh, to provide service to the tourists uh so they uh, to compare with the fishing uh, they they say that uh provide a service to the tourists is more uh, profit than uh, do the fishing so think about um yeah okay um so we, we're uh, set to wrap up at about 5.45, so a few more minutes here. Um, there are a couple, there are probably more questions in the chat that we're gonna be able to get to, but I did want to um, say, uh, uh, or, or, or read out two, two other questions. Um, one from Ashima, and I sense a little bit of maybe exasperation or desperation in her writing. I know it's hard to read into that when you're reading someone's um, typed message, um, but she writes uh, uh, only only some, really only some young people think about climate change problems. So how can we believe that young people will solve the problems of the climate crisis? Um, and so I think that speaks to, you know, some of our, um, our own anxieties about, okay, there's a youth movement, but um, you know, can we really just sort of rely on the youth to um, to be the sort of vanguard um, of, of this of this movement? Um, so that's that's from Ashima. And then Trem is saying, for the speakers who have held positions of power within the government or government agencies, have you seen more effectiveness and progress in the top-down approach towards environmental and climate justice? or from a bottom-up approach when you work with local communities to fight for justice. And so, um, yeah, the floor, uh, among the panelists, it's, it's open to, to uh, which, which of those questions you want to address. I know we only have a few, a few minutes. Um, of course, we can keep the conversation going uh, until about six o'clock, but 545 was the sort of formal hour um, when we were gonna end.
Well, I'm not I'm not in a position uh, of uh, any importance in any government. <laughs> I think the one person we had actually had to depart earlier. But I mean, in, in my work, I it it combination of both, I would say. Uh, and I don't want to sound uh, kind of Pollyannish about that. But in terms of, for example, um, the bottom up is in many ways uh, a learning process for government because they don't always understand entirely what goes on in, at the local level. And it's really important to have community-based um, effort or uh, voices uh, in, 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 in order to, in order for the government to fully understand um, the impact that they make when they create policies. But, but in the past decade, when civil society had moving much more toward policy making side is because we can advocate, uh, CSO or NGOs can advocate on many different things, but unless that get taken up into a policy arena, um, it doesn't last, it doesn't create the impact necessary. Uh, so, at, at, at a much larger scale than we can ever do as separate organizations working at the ground level. So it, it, it needs to be in, in the perfect world, um, it needs to have both in order to have that communication and uh, choices and options of what kind of solutions are most feasible and most effective. Uh, and, and there's always trade-off. So I think I think that's the kind of conversation that needs to happen. Uh, so on, on a range of issues, for example, communities can push for something, but sometimes it's very limited to that particular area. So you need to have a larger policy perspective in order to create much greater change at a much greater level. Uh, so I think it depends on the issues, uh, but but on the whole, you need to have you need to have both. On the issue of youth, um, I don't think we want to be idealistic by saying that only the youth can carry uh, uh, the burden of what we of 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 of, of this of this tremendous uh, uh, set of issues and responsibilities. Um, it's just that my observation is that uh, uh, is that at least if talking about Southeast Asia, that I have seen um, this incredible energy coming from a younger generation who really. Uh, integrate uh, environment and climate issues into the kind of work that they do in, into their hopes and dreams in ways that I think as Sheila mentioned earlier in, 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 in an earlier generation that we didn't have that. But I think it's a combination of both. Where I feel that it can, it, it really has been helpful is for an older generation with their expertise and experience to support this process. Um, but it's not not to say that that one generation or another is 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 carrying all the weight. Uh, I think we are we we are all in it together now. Uh, it's just that an observation is that as younger generation is 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 just much more um, natural in the integration of climate issues into political, social, economic life. Uh, and for us, it has been a much more of a process of coming to it uh, all, over time. Uh, rather than having to live, uh, uh, having to live with it as immediate uh, as a young uh, younger generation uh, has to, um, but I, I I would I would say that this is something that requires all of us in multiple strategy in multiple ways working together. Um, it's much too big for for any of us to work on this alone. I think there's a real incentive for young people to do something about it because they will inherit the, this planet and they will suffer. My generation will probably not see the worst of it, but I think the young, younger generation will see the effects of, of climate change and feel it much more intensely. I sense actually a lot of climate anxiety among young people and also a lot of take a sense of doing something at a very personal level you know, in their consumption, in what they eat, what they wear, in what they buy, in the way they dispose of their trash. Um, there's much more uh, sense that they have to be personally responsible for their climate foot footprint, which I don't see in, in older people. So that, that gives me hope. Um, you're right. I mean, a lot of young people are clueless about this, but you know, there's never a full consensus on, on, on many of these things. What it takes is a critical mass. 
and I see that there's a critical mass happening among the younger generation. All right, well, I think that's a, a, a really um, promising note to end on. Um, and thank you everyone for your incredible questions. Thanks to all of our panelists for this lively and very, very valuable generative discussion. Um, and to Joy, 